Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. This is, I was telling Matt, this is more people than normally I see when I do these <laughs> kinds of talks, so that's great. Uh, and hopefully I won't be a giant disappointment for your Friday morning uh, as, as we go through here. Um, a couple of things before I start, you know, somewhat overwhelming you with slides. I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the approach that I went through to kind of get to putting this presentation presentation <coughs> together and kind of where I come from uh, in terms of my orientation towards young people and these topics, uh, which is probably gonna help us understand some of these things. So when I do my work with and do research on young people, whether these are middle schoolers all the way up through, through college kids, I come at this from a very positive development, positive youth development framework where I'm looking at young people not as these things that we either need to fix, right? Like a lot of times we look at young people and we're like, man, without some intervention, they're just going to go so far off the rails, society's doomed. Uh, or looking at them as, you know, that they're out to try to trick us or they're out to try to deceive us or any of these kinds of things. And instead, I'm looking at young people and trying to understand their lives and really how can we help them reach whatever outcome they want for themselves. So how can we help them kind of live their best life? In the developmental world and the developmental uh, sciences, we talk about this as a concept of thriving. So how can we help you thrive to reach their, their full potential? So when I come at a topic like sexuality or I come at a topic like substance use, I'm situating it within that that framework, which leads to this somewhat, uh, somewhat interesting dialectic where I don't really believe, and based on the evidence and the research that I've conducted and the research that I read, that you can have healthy and safe substance use as a youth, but I do believe that teenage, teenagers can have healthy and safe sex. So when I put this stuff together, it, it, it was almost, it was kind of like a, well, I talk to parents and youth about substance use in this way because I don't want kids to do it, but about sex, I talk about it in a much more liberal and permissive way because I really want them to be empowered to engage in these behaviors in ways that are appropriate and safe and, and fulfilling for themselves. So some of that might come out, uh, come out through here. The other part uh, that I really wanted to emphasize is that everything that I'll talk about is research-based and it's data-driven. Even though I don't, did not throw a bunch of citations into the slides or anything, and I'm not gonna reference specific instances of research or anything like that because I didn't feel like you all wanted that level of detail, <laughs> uh, but I would be happy to share that level of detail uh, with anyone after we're done. But everything here is research-based. That being said, when we do this kind of research, we're looking at generally large populations of kids, and we're really looking at the average in the overall picture. And kind of what that means is your experiences with your children, whether they're your own children, the children you work with, the families you work with, may not fit the average. They may not be the look like the norm. So at the end of the day, you know your kids and you know your clients best. And so it's kind of up to you to take this information and put it into the context and use it in a way that's going to help them. Uh, along with that, there's no magic solution to helping kids thrive. And just like there's no magic bullet or one right way to talk to kids about these issues. So when I put this together, I was really struggling with this, like, I don't want to have to tell you or I don't want to tell you, like, this is the way that you should do this thing. Because that's a pretty not good use of our time. That was not very articulate, but it's Friday morning in the summer. Uh, so instead, what I really wanted to focus on was kind of answering four questions that in some way parents have asked me over the years. Uh, and my hope is that through answering the four questions, which I'll show you here in a second, you will then kind of feel empowered to kind of go off and either become more educated or learn more about these topics, 
put these topics into practice in your parenting, the way you work with families, you work with youth. So that's kind of kind of where we're at, which means there are some things that I'm not going to really talk about, which you might have expected. Like, I'm not going to talk about what is the substance that most youth use. I'm not going to talk about when do most kids start having different kinds of sex and, and things like that. Because in some ways, that's not really the point. The point is to start engaging young people in conversations about these topics and engaging with them in ways that things are actually conversations, that they're not just adults telling them, this is what you should do because this is what I want you to do. Does that make sense? All right, so that's kind of where we're, we're gonna start from. And so the four questions that I kind of built this around uh, and, and to agree, these are things, again, the parents have asked me or said to me uh, over the years when they find out that I, I study and work with young people. So why should I say anything? So, so why should I even talk to my kids about sex, sexuality, substance use? Uh, you know, there's, a, there's a lot of parental head burying in the sand. Of, you know, if I don't say anything, then my kids aren't going to ever do anything and, you know, we'll all just go on in our, our rosy, happy world. Okay, so then if, if you agree that you should say something, then it's, all right, what, what should I say? What are the things that I need to be talking to my, to my children about? What do we need to be communicating to youth? Uh, so we're going to go through some topics that are important, that are important developmentally that come up uh, time and time again. Then there's this issue of when should I say it? Right? So if you agree that you should talk to kids about these issues, then it kind of becomes this timing piece of, well, when do we have these conversations? Do we just need to have one conversation? Right? Can, we, can we just do some sort of a dare program in fifth grade and, and let, the, let the kids go on for the rest of their life? Uh, and then finally, how should I say it? Hey, we, uh, we, we know in, in through a lot of our research with parents, They'll be on board with the first three, and then they kind of get paralyzed by the fear of the fourth. So it's like the, the idea of, of talking to a young person, particularly about sex, and acknowledging that they're sexual beings and that they have sexual feelings and desires, and uh, you know, that, that's like, oh, that's just, that's too much, that's too much. Um, and it gets very difficult to figure out how to actually communicate that. So we're gonna go through each of these. And as we're going through absolutely questions, feedback as we're going through, it would be pretty casual, um, I, would, I would suspect. Uh, fair warning though, I will go down tangents if you send me down them, <laughs> and my students will tell you sometimes I don't come back. <laughs> All right, so, I think kind of an interesting place to start, one of the, the few data slides that I did pull together was, all right, well, maybe parents are already doing this and we can just enjoy some more muffins and coffee and, and, and chat about the weather and then all go about our days. So I looked at a couple of uh, data sources that I have that I have access to and I use. So one of them is the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, which is a nationally representative study uh, that they believe the CDC does, but it might be SAMHSA somewhere in the, in the federal government. And we do it every year. And it's a study of households in the United States. And then they select uh, individuals in the households to complete surveys. And so in this one, they actually uh, will select people 12 and up in the household. So it's one of the few surveys where they're actually asking teens about some of these issues. And so one of the questions is, have you talked with the parent about uh, alcohol, tobacco, or other drugs in the past year? And so from the 2015 uh, data, which is the most recent set of data, uh, so we had 58.2% said yes. That doesn't mean that they haven't had a conversation the year before, or that they won't have a conversation in the future, but you know, a little over half are, are, saying, are saying yes. So that means we've got a little over half who are saying no. It's pretty important to think about. Uh, another piece here, so then we have the National Survey on Sexual Health and Behavior, which we actually conduct at IU through our Center for Sexual Health Promotion. Uh, and in the 2015 survey, uh, we had an oversample of, of teenagers 
And so we have some of the only nationally representative data on teenagers and sexuality. And one of the questions we asked them uh, when, is, uh, when was the last time you had a, help, a helpful conversation about sex, condoms, uh, contraception, sexual health <coughs> with a parent? And 42.2% said that they had had a helpful conversation with a parent in the past six months. Now, they can have other time frames. So there's more folks, who, more kids who said that they had had this conversation, but it was at a later date. And I wanted to focus on the more recent conversation. But about 20% say that they've never had a conversation with a parent about, uh, about sex. Uh, then we had another question that we asked for only the young people who had said that they had started dating. So we're going to talk about when we get to the third question of when should I start talking to my kids about these issues. One of the times as a preview uh, is around when they start expressing romantic interests and, and feelings. So we asked those who had started dating, well, once you started dating, started dating, did you talk with a parent? Did a parent talk with you about uh, sex, sexual health, those things? So then we do get a, a little bit of a larger <coughs> increase here. So we get about 58% again, who are saying that they had this conversation after they initiated a behavior that we know is a prelude to sexual behavior. Uh, so if we look at this, I would actually see these numbers might be a little more positive than uh, what we might expect. Uh, and I think this is a, a really important point to kind of be driving home a lot of the times is, Oftentimes, parents are doing a lot better than we think they're doing, or we expect that they're doing, or sometimes they even tell us that they're doing. Right? There is such stigma around, particularly around sexuality and talking about sex with kids, that I think there are some parents who would not admit to their friends that they have these conversations with their kids, right? because they don't want to kind of be seen as the permissive parent or, or something like that. So it's sometimes it's nice to remind parents that yeah, a lot of you are already doing, doing good uh, and build off of that. Now, what, one of the things that we miss when we look at these kinds of, of questions though is we're not really getting at the content of what those conversations were. Uh, and so, you know, these 58% may have had a conversation that went something like, alcohol is bad, smoking will kill you, don't do it, all right, we're good, we're done, let's move on. Uh, so it's really important to also think about the content of what goes on in these conversations. But we're, we're at a pretty good start. So if we think about, again, yeah, trying to hit, where's my, there we go. Why should, again, this idea of why should we be saying anything? Why should we t be talking about, talking to you about these topics? You gotta just recognize and accept that these are big parts of their life. It's not to say that young people, and because most aren't, most aren't having intercourse, most aren't using substances, uh, most aren't smoking, though we are getting pretty close to most using vaping products, but that's, so we'll get to that a little later. But these are parts of their life. They're things that they talk about with their friends. It's what they see in the media. Right? You watch a television show that features teen characters, please find me one that doesn't involve substance use and sex. It just doesn't exist. Uh, you know, so they're parts of their lives, they realize that they're parts of their lives. Even if they're not engaging in these behaviors, what they're doing is they're forming the attitudes, beliefs, values that are gonna guide their future experiences. You know, one of the strongest predictors of whether or not teenagers do anything is if they think that they're going to in the future, right? And it seems really simple to say that, but we often underestimate when they make that plan, right? I can ask a sixth grader, do you think that you're gonna use drink alcohol in the next year? And they'll say no, right? almost across the board, they'll say no. If I ask them, do you think you'll use or drink alcohol when you're a junior in high school? Probably about 70% of them will say yes. Right? They're already forming those future orientations for what they're gonna have. You wanna be a part of shaping those future orientations. Uh, contrary to popular belief and the kind of the mythology that is out there in the, in the, popular, in the popular press, 
parents actually matter for kids, right? It's, uh, sometimes it can be hard if you are the parent of a teenager to feel like you matter because your teenager is changing a lot and what they prefer and what they want to do with their life and how they want to spend their time is very different than a younger child. And my sister has a uh, now 15, 14, almost 15 year old daughter. It's gonna start high school in the fall. And I was talking to, to my sister and she's like, you know, she comes home from school and she just wants to go up in her room and, and listen to music. Or, you know, she doesn't want to tell me about what happened in her day. I'm like, well, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, it's, that, that's, that's, and she's like, is that normal? I'm like, yeah, that's completely normal. And, you know, if you think about, or you, you understand kind of what's happening with young people at that time in their life and they're gaining these new cognitive perspectives and abilities, and they're able to reflect on their experiences in the world in very different ways than children. One of the reasons why and teenagers tell us why they want that time at the end of the day by themselves is because they're trying to think through what they just did during that day. You know, they're trying to think through, well, when I tried to sit with Susie at lunch, but there wasn't space at the table and no one wanted to come and sit with me at the other table, what did that mean? And they want to process that before they talk to their parents about it. But parents will often interpret that as, well, my kid just doesn't want to spend time with me. You know, they're, they don't care about my opinion anymore. And that kind of a mindset, and particularly at this middle school age and the transition into high school, can really lead a lot of parents to try to adopt this very permissive parenting style as a way to kind of be friends with their kid. Right? And the one thing that I always tell parents, you should have a good relationship with your kids you want to have a warm and loving and supportive relationship with your kids, but you are still a parent. All right? You are a parent until, you're, until you, you either you die or your children die. Unfortunately, <laughs> that's the way to think of it, but they're, you're a parent, and that's your role, uh, role for them. And then lastly, and the, you know, again, this idea of just kind of, we all have to be cognizant of the reality, youth are gonna learn about sexuality and substance use from somewhere. Right? It's, it's, if you don't talk to them about it, someone's going to talk to them about it. They're going to see, they're, you know, they're going to they're going to learn something on the internet, right? They're uh, either through uh, pornography or even through, you know, uh, health blogs and, and Facebook posts, and you know, they're they're going to come across these issues. They're going to talk about it with their friends. Um, it, it's just this omnipresent aspect of our society and our life. So you want to be there with them. You want to be helping them to understand this. One of the things that can, again, can kind of be a frustration for our parents is they may feel like, well, you know, I talked to my kids about this, but my kids still aren't doing things the way I want them to do it. Or, they're engaging in behaviors that I don't want them to engage in, or they're, I don't feel like they're really listening to me or supporting me, supporting my perspectives for them. So it's important, I think, to kind of think about and put together a little bit of a, uh, which we can't quite see as well as I could in my office, uh, a little bit kind of like a process diagram of how we think some of this works. Right? So, uh, on the one hand, on the one end, we've got parents' attitudes and values about any particular topic. And this process model kind of works for, for really anything. So if we think about it, you know, this could be what do parents feel um, is appropriate sexual behavior for their kids, or what kind of information do they think their kids need to know about sex? Uh, when do they think it's appropriate for kids to start drinking? Do they think it's appropriate for kids to smoke? Um, attitudes and values around substance use. And then on the other end of the spectrum, the other end of the process, we've got what is the kid actually going to decide? Okay. I think a lot of parents would like to think that it goes, well, what I want them to do is what they do, <laughs> which would be great. It would be great. But is not what happens. And in some ways, it's also kind of not what we would want to happen. Because if that's what's going on, then the kids aren't going to develop their own sense of self. Right? They need that sense of autonomy. They need that sense to see themselves as individuals and beings outside of the family uh, and outside of parental control. 
So what we actually think happens, and, and we have some pretty good data that would, would support this, is parents' attitudes and values get interpreted by kids. So the kids have a perception of what they think their parents think. Right? So they, they think what they think their parents think. That's scary because it means we're starting to start to pull away from the original source. Right? So we would not expect that this is a carbon copy of this. Okay. So what you think their parents think then is one of the influences on their <coughs> own behavior, their own attitudes and values. And use own attitudes and values are then what become the proximal influence the real main determinant of what they end up deciding to do. Parents, however, aren't the only source here, right? So we've got friends, which again, we often look at friends as, well, Jimmy made Johnny do that thing, right? We often look at friends as negative influences on you. There's actually quite a bit of, uh, of, of research that would support Good friendships can stop teenagers from doing dumb things. Uh, and then we also have this omnipresent media, which uh, is going to be television and movies, YouTube, social media, all of these things. And what's really important to understand is that these things aren't just influencing these attitudes and values. They're also influencing how youth perceive their parents' attitudes and values. So they're having this kind of dual, dual effect. So, you know, for example, if we think about something in the media, one of the really weird things in teen-based television programs, our parents are almost never present, right? It is very rare that you see a television show featuring teenage characters where parents are acting like parents and that they're there um, and that you see them and they're visible. Well, a youth might interpret that because youth often look at media and especially younger youth look at media as this kind of aspirational thing that they would like, oh, I would love it if my life were like this for my parents just left me alone. <laughs> uh, and so they might look at that and interpret, well, a good parent is one that really just kind of lets the kids do whatever and lets, their, uh, lets them form their own opinions and, and, and whatever. And so that influences then how they see their, youth, their, their parents' behaviors towards them. So they might see, well, my, I, I think my parent is intrusive. A 14-year-old wouldn't say that, but I feel like my, my parent is intrusive. They're trying to control how I think and act too much, so I'm just going to discard that. Right? can be the same thing with friends, right? You know, if you're at a friend's house and their parents act in a way, and then that goes back and changes the way that you then perceive the way that your parents act, right? So it's all, all part of this kind of recurrent system. And what I, is really kind of I think, important to think about here and, and understand is the reason that the conversation is so important to you, this is all back to the topic we're actually supposed to be talking about, the reason the conversation is so important is if you're not having the conversations, this link is not going to work in the way that you want it to. Because it's through the conversations that youth are going to understand the parents' attitudes and values, right? And if you think about it, it also reinforces this idea that these conversations have to be things that are continual and ongoing. Okay. So, why we should do this, another, another reason. So then the last part of why should, why should I say anything, right? uh, because it's going to make your kids better. Right? Uh, there is no evidence that talking to youth about sexuality, sexual behavior, sexual health, substance use, substance use attitudes and values makes them more likely to engage in those behaviors. This doesn't. Right? Uh, a lot of times parents are very concerned, well, if I start talking to my kid about sex, then they're gonna run out and have sex. They're not, they're not. They're gonna run out and have sex if they wanna run out and have sex. That's the, the reality. You wanna be the, the flea in the ear saying, well, if you're gonna have sex, you want it to be with someone that you trust and that respects you. And you wanna be doing so in a way that you're comfortable with, right? These kinds of things. Uh, 
So we know that when parents talk to their kids about sex, they tend to, kids tend to wait longer to have intercourse. Uh, they're more likely to use condoms when they have intercourse. They have a lower risk of STIs. Uh, and they're more likely to talk to their sexual partners about sexual issues. Right? And that's a big thing. We're really bad, not just as, as, um, as adolescents and youth, but also as young adults and adults of talking to our sexual partners about sex and what we want our sex lives to be like. So it's important that youth are able to do that. We also know that uh, they're gonna be less likely to engage in substance use and they end up having less uh, favorable attitudes towards substance use. The only kind of slight caveat to this here, and, it, <coughs> and it's, it's not quite the same as talking about it, but when parents let their kids drink in the home, before legal drinking age, then kids are much more likely to engage in substance use. They're much more likely to have substance use problems uh, into young adulthood. Uh, there's some very interesting research showing that parents who let their kids drink during high school when they get to college have far more alcohol problems during college um, than those who do not. So this idea of like the, the sips at home or, or the you know, well, if, if they drink in my house, they're gonna be safer it is just a fallacy, right? But again, that's not talking to the kids about alcohol, that's just letting them do it. Uh, and we would imagine those kinds of conversations probably don't go the way we would want them to. So, I would hope I spent more time on this than I wanted to. We're now to the point where we think we should talk to our kids about sex and, and substance use. Uh, so now if we turn a little bit to thinking about, well, what should I say? What should I talk to them about? I went back and looked at some of our data uh, again. And I also went back and I looked at, so this is the Indiana Student Survey, which is uh, done with uh, students in Indiana through the Indiana Prevention Resource Center, which is also a part of the School of Public Health uh, at IU. And they collect a lot of interesting information. <laughs> and some of the things that I pulled out uh, that were, were, I thought were pretty interesting here were, so youth reports of parents having clear rules about al this is alcohol, tobacco, and other drug use decreases pretty substantially from seventh grade to eighth, or to 12th grade, okay? And so this, these are proportions based on a enthusiastic yes response. So they ask the kids, uh, the, I think the question is, you know, do your parents have rules, clear rules about ATOD use? And the responses are, a big, bold yes with an exclamation point, a smaller yes, a smaller no, and then a big, bold no with, a, with an exclamation point. So these are the top line responses. This is the enthusiastic yes, and that goes down. Uh, concerning as well, youth reporting that they can ask a parent for help decreases from seventh to 12th grade pretty, pretty much, but Across all the grades, when the kids are asked, would your parents say it's okay or it's wrong for you to drink either every day, and then there's a second question regularly once or twice a month, almost across the board, they all say, no, my parents would say it's very wrong. From seventh to 12th grade, it would be very wrong. And we're talking like 95, 96%. So high putting the statistics in didn't even Weren't, weren't even really matter. But in terms of substance use, uh, in some ways, well, this would kind of suggest to me that one thing that we would want to then think about in these conversations is you want to make sure that you're clearly reinforcing to the kids what the rules are. You want them to know not just that you think that it's wrong for them to do this, but what are the rules that you have around this for them? Okay. The rules aren't going to be sufficient to stop them from drinking or using marijuana or smoking, but it's gonna be a pretty big first step. And then this here is pretty important too, because if there's one thing, I think we always want parents and kids to, to have is this kind of connection where a kid should never be afraid to ask their parent for help, right? And so this could be help about anything, but particularly issues around substance use and sexuality are big concerns for young people, right? And we don't want a kid to feel, well, no, I can't ask my, 
my mom or my dad or my whoever my caregiver is for help with this problem. You know, I started smoking and I want to quit, but I don't feel like I can ask my parent for help. So again, we probably want to make sure in these conversations we're reinforcing this idea that uh, you know I'm always there and available for you. So I went and I looked at our NSHB data where we asked them some questions about where did they learn about different information. So we asked them in the past year, where did they get helpful information about using condoms, uh, birth control and contraception, and then how to have sex. Now remember, if we go back, we say the kids have said, most of them have said that they've had a, con a helpful conversation about these topics, or a helpful conversation about kind of sex and sexual health. But it doesn't seem that these conversations are including these topics. And these are pretty important topics to talk about when we're going to talk about sexuality. We need to be talking about condoms, right? Uh, I am a huge proponent uh, of making long-acting reversible contraception, contraception available to young women, but LARCs do not protect against STIs. And one of the things that we are seeing over the past few years uh, that's somewhat perplexing <coughs> is we are at you know, the lowest teen pregnancy rates we have ever had in the United States. And syphilis and gonorrhea are going up amongst the same age group. Okay? And a lot of us are kind of interpreting this as, because a lot of young women are now on, they're using LARCs or they're using oral <coughs> contraception, and then people aren't using condoms as much anymore. And we see that in some of our data. So we need to, you know, keep reminding people that condoms are in fact important, uh, birth control, contraception, uh, and then how to have sex. You know, one of the things, yeah, that's gonna be a really awkward conversation to talk to a, a young person about how to actually have sex, defining what sex is and, and all of the, the myriad of things that can go with that. But, you know, I think it's an important term, but like sex is a normal and healthy part of our lives, and we should want people to have good sex. Sex that's pleasurable, sex that's enjoyable, sex that is amongst consenting uh, partners, right, who respect and trust one another. All of that goes into this concept of how to have sex. So it doesn't seem like we're quite getting these topics in, into some of these conversations. Uh, across the board, and it's also important to realize they're not getting picked up by other people, right? It's not like, oh, well, they're talking to doctors about these issues or clinicians instead. Nope, no, no, I'm not talking about them. Uh, I, when I was a, a, a teen, I had one conversation with my primary care doctor about alcohol, tobacco, and drug use, and sex. And that was when I was in the eighth grade and getting a physical to go to high school and the conversation lasted about five minutes. That was it. And it was a don't do it. And that was it. And we're done. It's like, all right, we're done. We're going to move on. Great. He was so proud of himself for having had that conversation. Great guy. Uh, so my doctor, until I was in my in, into my 20s, but uh, you know, it's not, it's not quite there. So they're not having these conversations. So that would say kind of at this very basic level, we need to be talking about these kind of very basic and straightforward sexual health uh, issues. Then I took a step back as I was putting this stuff together. I was like, well, this is, this is good, and let's see, and this is good, but this is pretty basic stuff, right? So I sat down and I just started making a list of what would Jonathan put <coughs> in a sexual health or a substance use prevention program. And it's all of this. And it's not even everything. I was, as I was driving here this morning, I was thinking of more things that I would put into, into these programs. And I don't want to go, I'm not going to go through all of them. But what I really want to emphasize here when we talk about what should I say to my kids about sexuality, what should I say to my kids about substance use, it's not as simple or it's not just as straightforward as, well, this is sex and you should always use a condom. And uh, you know, teen pregnancy can make make it difficult to achieve your life goals, and, and alcohol can have some harmful effects both in the moment and on your long-term brain development, and those kinds of things. And you know, this is how we resist peer pressure, which actually teens are already pretty good at doing. 
But there are these other things that need to be talked about and discussed, right? Like, you know, teenagers don't really understand what puberty is, right? I, I mean, I'm an adolescent health pseudo expert, and I can't explain to you everything that's involved in puberty, but it's a huge deal. You know, these issues around what is consent, um, romantic relationships, right? The, the, one of the really amazing things is that we have, we, we have separated romantic relationships from sex for young people. Like, we don't talk about them together. People who do sexual health education programming rarely talk about romantic relationships. And people who do romantic relationship education programs rarely talk about sex. But teenagers have sex with romantic partners primarily and almost exclusively. Well, you would think that those things might go together, but we don't. We don't talk about them together. Communication, they were sex practices, sexual pleasure, uh, developing their personal values, right? How do you help young people develop these, their own values? Brain and cognitive development, right? Uh, one of the reasons why I say I don't believe that you can have healthy and safe substance use for youth is because of the very, very important brain development things that are going on, right? There are new regions of the brain that are becoming activated during adolescence. Uh, they go through this period of kind of reorganizing the circuits of the brain so that they're able to process information faster and more quickly. And we've got data that shows, you know, heavy substance users don't experience those processes in the same way as those who do not. Uh, and our brains don't finish developing until we're in our mid-20s. Right? So these things are very important. Uh, parents, technology, legal consequences, media, mass marketing, right? You know, talking with a kid about, well, why does the Axe body spray commercial show a dude and he sprays himself and then all of a sudden all of these women are just all over him, right? What does that tell us about how we view gender and sexuality within our society and why might youth want to talk about those issues? Why might it be important for them? So all of these things that go in here, psychophysiology, all of these things. I put together this list, and again, it's not, ex not uh, exclusive of everything, because I really wanted to drive home this point, and I wanted to drive home this point, that this can't be a one-shot deal. It can't just be, I'm going to talk to my kid once, when they're in the eighth grade, and that's it, you know? It, it, it can't just be, well, my kid went through there in the fifth grade, and so we're good. Yeah. You made a statement near the time you, you first showed the slide that students are, are young, youngsters, good at resisting peer group pressure. Mm -hmm. And why do, you, why do you say that? Is that based on uh, research? Yes, yes. Data so, that, yes. Mm -hmm. So they form these opinions, mm -hmm. resisting peer group pressure, which mm -hmm. seems to be a good thing. Yes, so. Yeah. yeah, so. So the thing with, uh, so if we think about peer influences can kind of work in two, two ways. So we can have these peer influences that are what we would call a socialization effect, which is a fancy way of saying one kid gets another kid to do something, right? So that might be, all right, I'm gonna go to my friend and I'm gonna say, hey, I did this thing, it's really cool, you should try doing it too, which is kind of how I think the typical way that we think about this, right? Like, I used some smokeless tobacco, it was awesome, you should try some dip too. Uh, and it turns out that young people at about 13 or 14 stop being influenced in that way by their peers. So when we measure longitudinally over time youth's resistance to peer influence, and in whether this is through a self-report measure or some sort of an observational situation, we find that's, that it's kind of like, actually young kids, elementary age kids, are pretty susceptible to peer influence. It's just that the things they're being influenced to do aren't as dramatic as the, potentially as harmful as the things we see teenagers do. You start to get into that part of kind of middle uh, middle school, beginning of middle school, in that resistance then to peer influence goes up pretty dramatically. And by the time kids get to be about 16 or 17, they're pretty good 
at not doing things just because their peers tell them that they should. Okay. That's the one side of the thing. Now on the other side of the thing, now the, the other part that goes into this goes back to the brain development piece and why we see some things happen with youth and we assume that it's part of this peer pressure piece or peer influence piece, but it's really not quite. During adolescence, uh, two kind of really important regions of the brain are developing. One is the prefrontal cortex, right up around here, and it's uh, really heavily involved in what we call executive functioning. So your ability to make deliberate decisions, to process information, uh, uh, to kind of do some long distance planning, to perceive and understand uh, long-term outcomes. The second part of the brain that's undergoing a lot of change is uh, kind of in, around the amygdala in the mid to rear part of the brain. Uh, and it is involved in uh, sensory processing, socio-emotional processing. It responds very, very strongly and releases a lot of hormones around pleasure. Uh, and, and a susceptibility and a, a strong desire for pleasure. Larry Steinberg, who I'm gonna talk about here in a, another couple of uh, slides is a developmental psychologist who's really studied this and he talks about it as the executive functioning part of our brain is like the brakes on the car and the socio-emotional parts are like the accelerator. But what happens during adolescence is the socio-emotional part comes online and is fully developed about 13 or 14. And this, the cognitive control part doesn't develop until you're about 22. So there's about a, uh, somewhere around a five to eight year period where it's like you're driving a car with an accelerator and no brake. And what we know for young people is the times in which they get the most kind of internal sense of reward is when they're with other people and they're with their peers. And it really activates that socio-emotional center. So when they're with their peers, they are much more likely to engage in harmful behaviors we might want to attribute that to being, well, they're being pressured by their peers, but they're really not. It's that they're just really susceptible to the kind of the pleasure that's derived from those peer experiences. So it's kind of like it, it turns on the accelerator and they've got no way to break, right? The example I always use with my students is if you're 16 and you're by yourself at home and you've got a pool, it is not going to dawn on you to climb onto the roof and try to jump into the pool. It's just not, it's just not gonna happen. If you were 16 and you're at your house and you've got a pool and you've got your 10 best friends over and the music is blaring and someone says, hey, I bet I could jump off the roof into the pool. Someone's gonna get on that roof and jump on to try to jump into the pool. And it's not because they're being pressured to do it, it's because their brain just loves that experience so much. There, okay. Is that, was that helpful? Yeah, that was a tangent. <laughs> and we're back. Yeah. Yes? Yes, I, I don't completely agree with the way that you're phrasing it, mm -hmm. that they have no brains. It's not that they don't have, I, I would agree, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think there are individual differences. Someone mm -hmm. may jump off the roof, but everyone is not going Correct. To. And, yeah. and so, yeah, to me, it would be more accurate to say they don't have brand new brakes like yes. developed brakes. Yes, I, I, that, is, that is a good, uh, it's a good elaboration of that. Yeah, I oversimplified it a little bit. Yes, there are certainly people, there are individual differences both in, in the timing of the brain development uh, and there are some kids who seem to be able to activate that cognitive control center earlier and better than others. Uh, you know, so that that's certainly certainly uh, going to be that, right? Like I wouldn't have jumped off the roof. <laughs> just, well, most yeah. developmental psychologists, mm -hmm. people keep wanting to edge the uh, official data to develop it up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Historically, from 18 to mm -hmm. 21 to 23, mm -hmm. and I've even heard some proposals. 25. Mm -hmm. Well, like, well, let's just go ahead and make it 40. Right. Well, I, you know, in, 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 it's a, uh, yeah, it's, no, it's, it, it's a very, it's a very real point. This understanding of, well, when does adolescence actually end? 
you know, it's a it's a much harder question to answer than when does adolescence begin, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but it's some people have never ends. Some people never ends, right? And it's it, because our markers of what we consider to be adulthood are social, not biological. All right. Take home. We gotta have lots of conversations, right? We gotta have lots of conversations about lots of things. All right, so now we should be to the oh, yes. In the last part of the, the what should I say? So one of the things that parents yeah, also really uh, fast, yeah. I, just one of the things that um, Mike is talking about, mm -hmm. and I, I think that it, it also is important in terms of the what should I say, so, mm -hmm. so it's relevant here, is if you if you tell your kid, and I, I happen to have a 13 year old mm -hmm. who starts high school next year, so this is a lot of this <laughs> is resonating with me personally, not so much professionally, mm -hmm. but. Um, uh, if you, if I were to go up to my daughter and I were to, I, I think that I like the, the pool mm -hmm. concept, mm -hmm. but if I were to say something like, yeah, you know, this is this is what it is, and, and I've talked to her about it, make the mm -hmm. love versus from the love, mm -hmm. she don't like that conversation. Mm -hmm. her, but, um, <clears throat> if I were to say something like, yeah, kids would jump off the, the roof, I'm 100% positive that my daughter would look at me like, there is no way I would jump off that roof. Mm -hmm. And so, I think that you run the risk of if you turn it into kind of black and white, mm -hmm. and all or none, and, and, and that type of thing. I think with my daughter in particular, I run the risk of, oh, here's just another example of dad not knowing what the hell he's mm -hmm. talking about. Yeah. And so when you're talking to him, mm -hmm. being able to temper mm -hmm. when there are individual differences yes. and here's some yes. things, I think yeah. that's really important. Oh, I, I absolutely agree. And I would <coughs> not talk to a teenager about brain development in the way that I just explained it. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't try because I, I think that's not gonna be very meaningful for them. Instead Yeah, it actually pissed her off. Yeah. Because uh, <laughs> the last thing teenagers often want to hear is that they're not developed. Uh, uh, instead I would talk to them about like understanding how they might feel or act differently in a crowd versus by themselves and in a crowd of people they don't know versus a crowd of people that they know really well. Uh, and that kind of seems to be uh, a, little more, a little more useful. I think on the, when we talk in the, in the public health world, in the adolescent development world, one of the reasons that we focus a lot on this idea of this brain development and the susceptibility <laughs> to socio-emotional responses to peer things isn't so much that we've think that if we tell kids that, then they're gonna act differently. It's more that we, if we understand that, we can use harm reduction approaches to help reduce kind of risk behaviors, right? Like I wouldn't leave a group of 10, 16 year olds by a pool alone. I wouldn't sit out there in the deck chair and watch them, but I would be going in and out of the house. I would be, you know, I would make sure that there's an adult presence there. And just the idea of having the adult there can will really stop them from from doing a lot of a lot of things that we might not want them to do, uh, because the parent can act as the brake in, in some situations or the better brakes, right? Formula One car brakes versus the <laughs> the brakes that are on my Mazda. Uh, uh, so one of the things that parents often tell us uh, as well and we know is, is sometimes a barrier to having these conversations is that they feel like they don't know enough, right? Now again, I'm young-ish. Uh, <laughs> I've been studying these issues for well over a decade. You know, I went to a lot of school. Uh, I'm, I don't feel as though I know everything about all of these things. I read things every day that change the way that I think and know and understand these topics. Uh, so for parents who their job is not to remain as well informed as possible on these issues, it's probably going to be a little harder to be up to date on all of these issues. So I identified these are some really good resources for parents uh, to help learn more about some of these things. Uh, and I can send the web links to Matt and we can send them out or take a picture of the screen. That's what my students do in class now. I won't give them slides. Um, but the Office of Adolescent Health, which is part of Health and Human Services, has this really great 
um, set of resources for families on how to talk to kids about sexuality and substance use. Uh, I'm gonna show some of the information here in a little bit, but it's great. It's one of my favorite websites uh, for, for parents and family resources. The Indiana Prevention Resource Center has free trainings um, on substance use. They don't really have anything on sexuality, but they are free. Um, they were developed by faculty at IU. You create an account, you go in, they're web-based, they're wonderful, and you can learn probably more than you ever wanted to learn about opioids <laughs> or marijuana uh, or alcohol, but theirs are there. Uh, Advocates for Youth is a, um, an organization that's focused primarily on sexual health for young people. It has some wonderful resources on how to talk to kids about uh, sex uh, in particular. And then the Division of Adolescent and School Health from the CDC has a lot of very good resources, again, for parents. And I think it's important to give parents these resources and for parents to put the time into studying them. Because uh, if you're not doing that, then you're not gonna have these uh, uh, really effective conversations. Okay. Oh, we're gonna run long. I could stop if people want me to stop. Um, just shout at me. Um, uh, so when should I say it? So if we know that we need to say it, we kinda know what we need to say, when should I say it? Uh, I was just gonna stop with this uh, early and often, right? You know, uh, as early as possible and as often as possible, but then I, I decided to go into it a little bit more. Maybe from my experience, uh, uh, the first sexual health conversation I ever had with a parent was with my dad and I was in the third grade and he came home with like an eight millimeter reel projector in some like 1970s sexual health film that he checked out from the library and he projected it onto the wall in the living room and he made a, a thing of popcorn and he sat down and said, we're gonna, I found this really cool film we're gonna watch. <laughs> and it, I mean, it, it was a stereotypical 1970s, I can still remember. It wasn't bad or anything, but it did kind of start a, a process where I certainly felt comfortable during my adolescence to be able to express opinions and perspectives to my parents because, you know, they'd started this early, early on. Um, you know, so maybe don't show up with an old school projector <laughs> in a 1970s health film. But again, you know, uh, you, you can start having these conversations in developmentally appropriate ways, young and, and again, often. Uh, if we're looking for some hot spots, uh, developmental transitions are really big, particularly around the transition to puberty, uh, because that's when a lot of our sexual maturation happens. It's very important to understand that. Uh, to understand what's going on, uh, and you know, and, and I'll say now, and I'll, I'm going to say several times again, you know, young boys need to know what's happening with young girls, and young girls need to understand what's happening with young boys, right? This idea of, you know, well, I'm a young man, so I only need to know about sexual development and reproductive health for, for young men is, is not a good idea, right? And it's the same way uh, for our young women. School transitions are also very, very big. So, Transition from elementary to middle school, middle school to high school, uh, high school to whatever your kids are gonna do next. Uh, the rates of alcohol use double going from eighth to ninth grade. Um, so they go from about, uh, in nationally representative data, they go from about 27-ish percent of kids saying that they tried or used alcohol to just over 50% by the time you get to ninth grade. Um, which kind of tells us there's something going on there, and that might be a time we definitely want to have these conversations. Uh, so those are, those are very big. And there may be other transitions that happen in your kid's life that you kind of see and, and know about. Uh, if they start beginning to express romantic and sexual interest, this is not going to be as simple as them coming home and saying, I want to go on a date with someone so this weekend they asked me out, can I, can I go? This is going to be a process of kind of understanding, you know, well, what kind of media are your kids looking at? They started looking at things where it's like, oh, that's a little more sexualized than it once was. 
Uh, are they starting to talk about relationships that they see in shows? Okay. Uh, if you work with young people or you have a, a, a teenage child and you have not come across the term shipping, I shall define this for you. It is the process of advocating for romantic relationships amongst fictional characters. Uh, and this is the thing. I have had long conversations with my 14-year-old niece about the ships that she believes in in the shows and books that she reads. Right? Uh, so if they start talking about these things, those are really good opportunities to start talking about what this might be like for them and their own lives and how are these reflections <laughs> of their own values. If you give kids new levels of autonomy, give a kid a new curfew. I had a company that talked about getting a new curfew with a conversation about what are your expectations for them to be able to maintain that curfew. Right? If they get a job, right? Uh, you know, if they're now allowed to come home and stay by themselves after school instead of going to an after school program. And again, it doesn't have to be this full fledged conversation going through every one of the 55 different topics every time, but you just use these uh, as opportunities. And then of course, teachable moments, right? You're watching television together, you see something. Maybe not in that moment, but maybe once the show's done, go back and talk about that. Uh, they tell you about something that they saw happening in the news, or something that happened to their friend, or maybe something that happens in their, in their family, or in your family. And it doesn't have to be, like I think our, we automatically jump to these horrific things, but they don't have to be that, right? So my, my sister, who thankfully lives like four states away, so she's never going to know that I use her as an example all the time. Uh, she is, she's a, a, a now three kids. She's a 15-year-old, uh, or 14-year-old, almost 15-year-old. We have the 11-year-old. And now we have a seven-month-old. Right. So my sister uh, was divorced, and she got remarried, and her, her new husband decided they wanted to have another baby. Uh, great little kid. That was a great time to start talking to my nephew about sex, right? And like, mom's going to have a baby. This is what that means, right? Uh, the most that he was, I think, really freaked out about the whole discussion was about getting acne, because he started talking about puberty, and he was like, in puberty, you get pimples, and I don't want pimples. Like, All right, good luck, kid. Uh, but you know, this is a normal, you know, it's a normal family experience. It's a, you know, it's a normal time, and, and it's a, a good teachable moment to, to talk about those things. So they don't always have to be like these, these horrible teachable moments. I would add, yep. when, you, when your kid starts to drive. Oh yeah, yeah, that's a big, I, I can't believe I missed that one, absolutely. And the later you can let your kid drive, the better. Uh, just put that, put that off as, as much as possible. Uh, Oh, that's the most dangerous thing you can let kids do, is drive a car. Uh, uh, absolutely. It, I, and it kind, of, it kind of goes back to, again, that idea of their, kind of their reaction abilities and their, their planning abilities. You know, where we see kids being safer drivers is with really strong graduated systems where you know, they get a per or they get a, a license and they can only drive with a parent in the car for like nine months. And then maybe they can drive by themselves, but only during the day. And then maybe they can drive by themselves during the night. And then like two years later, they're allowed to have another unrelated person in the car. And many states have those policies. Uh, Indiana is not one of them. Uh, neither is Kansas where my, my niece lives and can get a permit at 14. Which is scary. Thankfully, she doesn't want to drive. Uh, but yeah, you know, a car is, you know, it, again, it's one of the most dangerous things we, we can let we can let kids do. All of the really dumb things I did as a kid were with a car. Um, I, I have, I am lucky I'm still alive, uh, honestly. So yeah, but yes, if we're gonna let them drive a car, that would be a great time to have some conversations about these things. Uh, we're, we're getting close to, to the finish. So now we're on to the last question. Uh, how should I say it? 
Larry Steinberg, uh, who's, who's one of my favorite adolescent developmental scientists and, and, and scholars, has this really wonderful book that I have on a slide of resources at the very end uh, that everyone should read. And he has these three principles for effective parenting. And they're really simple. They're really, really simple. Be warm, be firm and consistent, and be supportive. And across decades and decades and decades of research, uh, what we have found is that these three things help kids thrive. Consistent and constantly across all socioeconomic uh, groupings, racial and ethnic groupings, across all ages. It's being warm, being firm, being consistent, and being supportive. If we can think about these kind of principles into the context of talking about uh, sexuality and substance use, is kind of setting the tone for how these conversations will go. And we'll talk about this in a little bit. But it's kind of this idea of you, you just want to be adopting these principles when you're talking about these things. And my, my recommendation, or my, kind of my framing on this is we should treat and be treating sexuality and substance use in the same way that we treat every other parenting topic and other, every other parenting task. You know, if a kid is struggling in geometry, we don't throw our hands up and go, well, I don't remember geometry, and I'm not up to date on all of the current geometry, so I'm just not going to say anything about it. I'm just going to let it go. Right? No, we don't do that. So why, when we hear a teenager talking about you know, their, their sexuality, and particularly in sexual behavior, and maybe in a way that we're like, that's just really not a healthy perspective, where we'd be like, well, I'm just not going to. It's a little too dicey. I don't want to dig in there. Or the same thing if we hear them talking about substance use, or they're playing a video game, or they're watching a movie, and they start to express some sort of, uh, they express like a pro-substance use attitude, you know, why, why would you not, in that moment, in the same way that you would do for any other parenting issue, step in and, and you know, be a, be a parent. That being said, um, I know it's not the same as every other parenting decision. It's not the same as talking to your kid about how they're doing in math class. It's not the same as talking to your kid about whether or not they want to keep playing soccer. Um, and so if we look at the Office of, Office of Adolescent Health again, they have these conversation tools, which uh, are very helpful, uh, both in terms of giving some guidance on how to have conversations. They're like mock conversations. They're lists of frequently asked questions where they've gone and asked teenagers, what do you want to ask your parents? and all of those things are there. Uh, but I like these because they go along very well with what Steinberg talks about for uh, parenting practices. You know, so conversational and supportive, right? If you're gonna talk to your kids about these issues, don't start accusing and lecturing them. Okay? I wouldn't show up at the 15 point, or 15 slide PowerPoint uh, like this, and we'd say, all right, we're gonna sit down and have this conversation. And I wouldn't accuse them either. You know, teenagers will shut down if you say, well, you know, I know all teenagers drink, so I'm going to tell you why this is bad. They're going to, you lost them right there. So instead, have a conversation, you know? And a conversation is not what we're doing right now. I am lecturing right now. A conversation is a back and forth, right? It is an acknowledgment of the other person and their, their attitudes and their perspectives, responding to them, uh, going there. Be present and engaged, right? You know, uh, this can be particularly hard because you might think not feel like your kid is present and engaged with you in this conversation, but they are, they are. Uh, but you can't also hide behind your phone. You can't also look at the ceiling and, and look away. Uh, you have to be engaged, and especially when responding to their questions. Don't duck. All right, we don't want to duck questions. If you don't know the answer, go find the answer together. What a great teachable moment. I don't know what the, the failure rate of condoms are when used consistently and appropriately. Let's go look that up together. And then you can talk about what is consistent and appropriate and inappropriate condom use. All right? uh, uh, pick your opportunities, right? uh, again, and, and this is, I think, a, a broader parenting suggestion. Uh, heats of the moments are not going to yield good results. Okay? You gotta let people calm down, whether that's the kid or whether that's yourself. And sometimes maybe that means something's happened, 
a discussion, a conversation needs to occur, but maybe it needs to occur a day later. And so that people can kind of calm down and you can figure out well, how you want to really proceed. Uh, and then finally, it can always be fact-based. Uh, teenagers are very good, young people are very good at finding information. They will find the information that contradicts the claim you make <laughs> if the claim you made is not true. So don't, you know, don't overgeneralize, don't oversell, uh, be honest and, and fact-based. They will appreciate that, they will appreciate that. Uh, the Office of Adolescent Health also has, uh, has this wonderful model for uh, answering questions, right? Parents tend to be pretty good at telling. They don't seem to be quite as good all the time as responding to questions. And so they have this ABLE model. We love acronyms, easy to remember. Uh, so you answer the question if you can. If a kid asks you a question, answer the question, right? We, if you don't know what, again, if you don't know what the answer is, you go and find the answer. Go find it together. But don't just be like, well, I'm not gonna answer that. Uh, fair warning, that may bring up some questions that you don't want to answer, right? You know, if a child asks you, well, when, how old were you the first time you had sex? Yeah, you, you got to think about that. But you should answer the question. Uh, you should answer the question. Uh, chances are your kid's actually not going to ask you that. Um, but be brief. Be brief and to the point, right? So don't, do, you know, you, Answer the question, right? Get to the point, answer the question. Don't go on 55 <coughs> different tangents like I normally do. Yeah. yeah. If I answer the question, do you mean give the factual answer? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I disagree with that. I, I think there's more than one point of view. I, mean, I think as a parent, you're entitled to have limits on what you tell your children. Right. You, and you're, you're certainly fair to in, in, in do that. And again, it goes at the very beginning. You all know your families and your kids, I don't, and so it's putting it into the context of what works for you. But if a child asks you, if a teenager asks you a fact-based question, I think you should give them a fact-based answer. You can not agree, right? Like you can, you can not support the fact, right? You know, you may not support. There's a difference between values and facts. Yeah. Well, like for, for example, and this is, this is an untrue thing, but let's say mm -hmm. for example that I had been busted with heroin and spent two years in juvie, mm -hmm. you know, when I was 12. Mm -hmm. There is no stinking way I'm going to tell my daughter. She's not prepared to hear that. So I think that I can answer the question in a way mm -hmm. that she's prepared to yeah. hear it. But there's no way I'm going to say, oh, yeah, you know, I was raped as a 10-year-old or mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. right? And I understand that that's different than sex. Mm -hmm. But for some people, that would be factual. Right. And so I guess... I think that there... I think that there you can a answer, maybe be prepared if you have some things that mm -hmm. you don't want to answer. Correct. Most of the, those types of questions are on the rare side of what young people ask their parents. What young people are gonna ask their parents are things like, well, you know, marijuana really isn't all that bad for you. Like, is marijuana worse for you than alcohol? It's actually not, right? That's the factual answer. You doesn't necessarily mean that you're telling your kid, or you would say, "Well, I support you using marijuana," but trying to, I, I guess, where, where I'm coming from is this idea of answer the question and answer the question fact, factually is on these things where we tend to valueize, which is not really a word, uh, how we see them. Right? We want to be factual about what they can actually do to us. So what are the actual effects that different substances have on the body? Okay, but you, right. Even just what you just said, mm -hmm. um, a slippery slope would be, and this again is not, this is a hypothetical mm -hmm. situation like the other things mm -hmm. that I just said, but let's say that my daughter had been really interested in the taste of wine, mm -hmm. not a big deal, okay, mm -hmm. well I just gave you a sip of wine mm -hmm. and then I tell her that I think that alcohol is more more harmful than marijuana mm -hmm. it, it, is that does that mean that i'm i mean my daughter is smart enough to think mm -hmm. oh dad just said i could go smoke a joint well you i know, mean, that's so I what, think that's yeah. why i think that the, there are ramifications mm -hmm. to what we say the, absolutely and that's why you wouldn't just end the conversation there that's where you then talk about your attitudes and values that go along with it your your attitudes and values to some degree are separate from the reality of the thing 
Um, and that's just how we are as, as humans, right? You know, so you can say factually correctly, marijuana and alcohol, similar effects, similar effects for adults on the brain, on uh, you know lifestyle, all the all those kinds of things. But that doesn't mean that you're condoning one or the other. I, I wouldn't just leave it at that and walk away. Right? I would then be expressing what are my expectations for my child in terms of these things. And my expectations would be that you're not going to use either of them until you're an adult. And you can make those decisions um, as an adult. So I think that that's kind of where, where we get. And that's where I think it's important to be factual. Now, again, if there are things from your past that you don't necessarily want to talk to your children about, that's okay because that's your autonomy as an individual, but also be prepared for if they ask that and you say, well, I wanna talk about it, right? That's not gonna be a good solution either. Instead, maybe it's, this isn't about me and my experiences, these are about you and your experiences. And again, these are my expectations for you as my child and what I would like to see for you in your life. It doesn't mean they're gonna follow those things. Right? You know, they're not gonna always do what you want them to do all of the time. If they did, that would be awesome. Best kids ever. Uh, but that's just not the reality. Okay. Uh, so yeah, brief, leave the door open, uh, and then end with a supportive comment, right? So I, I'm really happy that you brought this question to me. I hope we can talk about this again in the future. And then uh, everyone gets back to their day. All right. This is, no. We have time. Do we? It goes to the Oh, I thought it went to 840. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And I cut a bunch of content. Um, all right. So strategies to reduce awkwardness. Hey, uh, so, so make a plan and practice. And so, you know, particularly if you want to have one of these really in-depth conversations uh, where you're covering lots of different topics, uh, I would make a plan and I would practice it, especially if you don't feel comfortable talking about these things. Sitting side by side rather than face to face. Uh, I, I, sitting side by side on the couch it actually helps a lot than sitting face to face <laughs> Uh, uh, across the table. If for no other reason, then you're not going to be reading each other's facial cues as much. Uh, we can get rid of some of that uh, non-verbal non communication. Um, use a TV show or a movie to, to break the ice, right? So again, um, maybe not in the moment that your kid's watching their favorite show, because they probably won't, won't thank you for that, but maybe afterwards. Uh, have a conversation about that, or maybe you saw something that you think would be a good good opener uh, to to talk about to talk about these things, talk about these things with them. Um, uh, and, and one of the somewhat things that people kind of get are surprised when we make this recommendation. It's a pretty common recommendation: is you go on a car ride. Okay, now you're sitting side by side and no one can jump out of the moving vehicle. Uh, so the, the conversation's uh, gonna happen. And you can make it part of you know, a fun day out or something. So maybe uh, you're gonna go to, go to holiday, holiday World. That's within driving distance of here, right? Yes, I think so. You've only lived here for six years. Um, you know, and so as you're going on there, you, know, you, you can talk about some of these issues as you're driving up there, then you get to have a fun day uh, and come back home. Uh, you know, some of these things um, where we can kind of slightly go a little bit of a right is what you don't want to do is kind of like surprise and contain your kid. So like, hey, we're going to go on a car ride, and they get in the car, and you lock the doors, and you're like, all right, for the next 45 minutes. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I wanna talk about sex. I wanna talk about, I wanna talk about marijuana. Um, and, you know, and instead maybe part of this can be in part of your plan is you know, to let your child know, you know look, I'm gonna be starting high school soon. Uh, I think it's really important that we have a conversation about uh, 
you know, social pressures and about sex and substance use, and I, I want to have that conversation with you. So I, I thought it might be fun to go to Holiday World, and we could talk about it as we drive up there. So your kids allowed to prepare themselves for it, so they can prepare their questions. If they have their questions, you can prepare what you want to say uh, to have the, these kinds of, of, of more uh, bigger, bigger conversations. Okay. All right. Uh, and this is the, the last slide, I hope. Uh, so a lot of times we, we get asked, you know, well, do I need to talk to my son and my daughter differently about these things? And, you know, should only a father talk to his son and a mother talk to her daughter about, about these issues? And, and I say no, right? This is, again, this is a part of parenting. Uh, it's part of the, the thing you signed on for. Maybe you didn't realize it, but she did. Um, and we want youth to feel comfortable talking about these issues to, with both of their parents. And again, I really, really think it's important for young men and young women to know what is going on with everybody. Right? Like I, um, I think it's very, very important for my nephew to understand menstruation and understand gender and understand um, uh, gender socialization and, and media messages and all of these things uh, that, that go into how we have these kinds of conversations. And, and I want my niece to understand uh, male reproductive anatomy and I, I want my uh, you know, I want them both to understand the different kinds of messages that are given to, to young men and young women around sexuality and around substance use. And that's where I think the point is that's really important here, is that we should all recognize how our own individual orientations towards gender and sexual identity might influence how we talk to our kids, talk to young people about these issues. You know, we have some pretty consistent sexual scripts in the United States that emphasize this idea of young women as pure and to be protected, but men, young men, to be pursuers and aggressors. Uh, we have views on you know, what makes up masculinity and, and femininity that certainly contribute to a lot of health risk taking by, by young people. Um, and we want to understand that. And then for our, our LGBT youth, right, we, there's a, a certainly an emphasis on self-silencing. Right? Like, well, we're not going to talk about what might be specific sexual health issues of uh, gay and lesbian youth because we're just, it's too much. It's too much. It took too, took too much to get to the point that we should talk to young people about sex. Now they're having sex in ways that are different. So let's not, so I, you know, so, so there is a lot of self-silencing that's directed to youth who are uh, LGBT or who are questioning or trying to understand their sexuality in ways in which they don't feel comfortable then expressing to, to parents. Okay. Oh, okay. Summing up. So a little <coughs> longer than I thought I would talk, but that's how it always goes. Um, so you should say something because it's important. Right. Uh, in some ways, this was all, almost the only slide I was going to bring. Um, it's important. right? You need to help kids thrive, and these are important areas of their life. Uh, we need to be willing to talk about a lot of stuff. Right? It's not just how do you put a condom on a penis. It's not just you know why is binge drinking bad. It's all of the other things that, that are uh, a part of that, uh, those situations and, and those experiences. We're going to talk about these things early and often. Big conversations are great, but so are a bunch of smaller conversations where you're just letting your kids know what are your attitudes and values and what are your expectations for them. And we want to do this in a warm and supportive way that encourages ongoing conversation. Uh, so then I have, these are just Again, the, the resources. And then this book, and it's called Age of Opportunity uh, by, by Larry Steinberg. Um, you get it on Amazon. It's not a textbook. It's like 14 bucks. But I actually use it in one of my undergrad classes. 
because uh, it's just a wonderful book uh, that goes through kind of everything that, that happens during adolescence and provides some really helpful suggestions on how to help kids kind of reach their potential. All right, that is, that is it. I'm sorry I talked so long.